First of all, I would express my sincere thanks for the honor of be being invited to deliver the 2018 Schaeffer Lectures here at Yale Divinity School. It's a great honor for me to appear in the series of distinguished scholars presenting some aspects of what has become the task of my life, interpreting the Gospel of John. I'm, you have heard the list of predecessors of, from my home country, and I'm deeply humbly, humbled to appear in that list. And I'm also grateful to the dear colleagues and friends here for the invitation and preparation of this event. Theology and history in the fourth gospel. Exactly 50 years ago, in 1968, J. Louis Martin published his famous study on history and theology in the fourth gospel. This small book is a landmark study, together with Ray Brown's magisterial commentary that was published in the same period. It has changed the views about the fourth gospel in North American scholarship and beyond. Expanded in his second edition, Martin's book opened up new paths to understanding the fourth gospel beyond the classical interpretations of Rudolf Bultmann and C.H. Dodd, the champions of Johannine studies in the mid 20th century. In contrast with Bultmann and Dodd's explanation of John from a Hellenistic or even Gnostic context, Martin explained the gospel from a Jewish or Jewish Christian background. He addressed a challenge posed by the polemic against the Jews as uttered by the Johannine Jesus, a problem that made reading John so troublesome, particularly after the Shoah. The hostility between Jesus and the Judaioi is historically explained as a result of the tragic history of the Johannine community and the separation between Jewish Jesus followers and the synagogue. Consequently, these polemical passages are definitely not words of the history of, Je of the Jesus of history, but rather triggered by the history and situation of the evangelist and his community. With regard to this dark side of John, it is obvious that the fourth gospel needs a critical interpretation, which could not be established as long as scholars continued to derive its legacy from an eyewitness testimony and defend its historical accuracy or the substantial authenticity of the words of the Johannine Jesus. From today's perspective, 50 years later, Martin's landmark study fits into a period of scholarship which was quite optimistic in reconstructing the literary history of the fourth gospel and the development of the Johannine community. After the primarily theological interpretations by Bultmann and Dodd, scholars in the 1960s gradually returned to, the, to historical issues. They started about thinking about the Johannine community, about the historical situation and its development but their optimism about reconstructing sources or redactional layers was probably overstated, as we come, came to discover in the 1980s through the observations of Alan Culpepper and others concerning John's narrative design. Therefore, Martin's story of the history of the Johannine community from its Jewish Christian origins, through the separation from the synagogue until the elaboration of its high Christology appears all too novelistic in its details. In particular, the key event suggested by Martin, a general expulsion of the Jewish Jesus followers from the synagogue by the so-called Synod of Nam Yamnia and the rabbinic rephrasing of the Birka Taminim, the curse of the heretics, has been decisively questioned by specialists in Jewish literature and history. Finally, Martin's stimulating idea that the gospel is actually a two-level drama was certainly overstated. When John 9 narrates that Jesus heals a man born blind, we cannot assume that this is actually mirroring a similar event in the Johannine community, such as the healing of a blind man through a Christian charismatic or preacher. It is still the history of the earthly Jesus that is narrated in John, even though the image of the Jews and the Pharisees and also the expressions of Christology and faith are obviously shaped by insights and experiences from the post-Easter period of the Johannine community. On the other hand, Martin's image of the two-level drama is quite perceptive and stimulating. There are indeed two levels in John's narration of the Jesus story 
the level of the history of the earthly Jesus and the level of the situation of the community of Etrusis. But how are these two or more levels connected in the Johannine text? Can we still separate them, figuring out what is historically true and what is mere interpretation or theology? Or are they connected to an almost inseparable unity so that the insights and fears of the community of Etrusis are introduced into the narration of the history of Jesus and consequently the earthly Jesus is presented in the light of later Christological insights as a divine being? And if this is true, what is the function of that fusion of horizons which makes John and his representation of the history of Jesus so unique among the Gospels? These are the questions to be considered in the present series of lectures. And it's no coincidence that I have reversed Martin's title. Martin started from history to explain the theology of the gospel. John's high Christology was explained as a product of and answer to the separation of Johannine Jewish Christians from the synagogue. But what if the reconstruction of the history, and in particular the history of thought development, is fragile and questionable? While acknowledging and actually presupposing a number of fundamental insights from Martin, I will make my inquiry in the reverse from theology to history. How can we investigate the history behind John's Gospel if the priority is theology, or rather Christology as theology? How can John and theology explain the unique representation of the history of Jesus in this Gospel? And how can we still discover historical traditions or splinters of historical information in John? In this reverse perspective, I will critically discuss more recent tendencies of looking for historiography or historically valid traditions in John and ask about the character of the history we can find in the Gospel. I will therefore depart from the insights of more recent scholarship in which the Gospel is primarily read as a coherent narrative unity and kept together by a dense web of metaphors. I intend to do this without ignoring the task of the interpreter to ask about the historical traditions and their possible value and to understand how and why the evangelist adopted, reshaped, rearranged, and interpreted his materials. In ancient Christianity, the Apostle John, considered to be the author of the fourth gospel, the three epistles, and Revelation, was not only considered the eagle evangelist, who soared to particular spiritual hates, but was also given the honorary title, the theologian, or theologos. This term, attested already in origin and used in orthodox theology until today, does not point to theology in the modern sense of the world, world as a particularly rational talk about God, but to the fact that it is John who most clearly expresses the divinity of Christ. Here, not only the primordial Logos, but also the incarnate Jesus is said to be Theos, God, or even the true God, who is one with the Father. Unlike Mark, where scholars could find a messianic secret, John presents Christ from the very beginning in his divine glory, which is said to be revealed in his signs. Therefore, the Gospel of John became the most important biblical source for the later development of the doctrines about the Trinity and about the two natures in Christ. To be sure, John is not the only New Testament author to express the divinity of Christ. Such a divine dignity of Jesus is also expressed in other late writings of the New Testament, such as the pastorals, Second Peter, or Revelation, and likewise the Apostolic Fathers. Although these writings focus on the exalted Christ, not on the incarnate one, or on his earthly ministry. In earlier New Testament writings, things are somewhat more difficult. In Hebrews 1.8, the predication that God is only from a biblical quotation, Psalm 45, Septuagint. And in the disputed passage in Romans 9.5, the predication is taken from a doxology, where it was most probably referring to the one God of Israel. Accordingly, these two writings cannot be counted as a testimony for a direct reference to Jesus as God. Although recent scholarship has increasingly supposed that a high Christology, 
which considered Jesus to be a superhuman or divine being, developed from a Jewish paradigm quite early within the Jesus movement, it is obvious that it took a certain amount of time until Jesus' followers could dare talk about Jesus explicitly as God. Mark's gospel already expresses Jesus' divine dignity and power in narrative terms in the stilling of the storm and presents a heavenly prologue in which God, or at least the scriptures, already address Jesus as a pre-existent one before his earthly appearance and his baptism. But Mark still avoids the predicate theos, as do Luke and Matthew, who still limit the tame theos to the one God of Israel. In John, this has changed. Jesus, not only the pre-existent one, but also the incarnate one, is called the monogenes, the son, and even explicitly theos. And Thomas confesses Jesus' divinity when he sees the marks of the nails on his hands, that is to say, in view of the incarnate and crucified one. In John, Christology is expressed as theology, while on the other hand, theology is inseparably linked with Christology. That is, just as the invisible God is exclusively disclosed in his only image, in the earthly figure of Jesus of Nazareth, in and through whom the Father can be seen, so also the human figure of Jesus of Nazareth, whose father and mother are well known, is presented as God from the beginning of the gospel until the end of the narrative. We can hardly imagine the challenge of such a claim to regard as divine a human being who lived and acted in the flesh and even died the death of an accursed criminal by means of Roman crucifixion. While the idealistic reading of the gospel from Bauer to Käsemann undervalued and downplayed the relevance of Jesus' real humanity in John, these aspects are consistently retained. He is the word that became flesh and not merely appeared in an epiphany. He is a Jew, has a father and a mother, and acts with a precise, in a precisely defined region at named places and at a particular time. He is even tired and thirsty, weeps and has zeal, and ultimately dies a human death, one that is far from being a noble death, but is in instead a shameful death. The crucified one is mocked and beaten by the soldiers and is exposed by having his last shirt stripped off. Jesus' divinity is not accomplished by a reduction of his humanity. The paradox of the author's portrayal of Jesus through human flesh, emotion, suffering, and death, while at the same time depicting him in divine colors and even calling him God, constitutes the strongest theological challenge of the fourth gospel. This presentation is not only the exalted, but also the incarnate earthly Jesus as God, meant a twofold challenge for John's contemporaries. Greco-Romans and Jewish readers alike. Within a Greco-Roman pattern of thought, it was commonly presupposed that gods are immortal and that a person who re has really died cannot be truly considered a god. Thus, if the Logos and also the incarnate Jesus truly was a heavenly divine being, Greco-Roman readers had immense difficulties in understanding his true humanity, his human nature, his human emotions, suffering, or even death. Interpreters in the second century developed a large variety of strategies to negotiate those problems. Some inserted a distinction between the truly divine logos and the one that actually created or shaped the material world, or distinguished between a heavenly Christ who stayed in heaven and another one who appeared on earth. Others felt the need to reconsider the nature of Jesus, speculating about the material quality of his body or whether he actually left footprints on the ground. Most scandalous for the church were interpretations according to which the divine power departed from the human Jesus prior to his crucifixion. All these readings, somewhat imprecisely labeled as docetic, only point to the challenge, the paradox of the incarnation and the death of the divine being necessarily meant for most of Greco-Roman, particular Platonic readers of John. And although we cannot prove that it was already necessary for the evangelist to react to some kind of desertism, 
The wording of John 1.14 suggests that he was well aware of the challenge implied by in the idea that the truly divine eternal world did not merely appear but became flesh in the human figure of Jesus who died on the cross. The abstract idea of incarnation is only slightly illustrated in John by the adoption of the biblical concept of God's dwelling among his people. The world, the world became flesh and dwelt among us. But as this tabernacling of the Logos is considered not only a temporal epiphany, but a permanent presence, even in the death of Jesus, the challenge of God's eschatological presence in a mortal human being is by no means removed. Even more obviously, John's high Christology provided a challenge for contemporary Jewish readers. Compared with Greco-Roman thought, the biblical and Jewish tradition felt much more obliged to observe the line of demarcation between gods and humans, or rather between the one God and his creatures. While in Greco-Roman tradition, gods could appear on earth and humans could eventually become heroes or receive a share in the divine nature, biblical monotheism, as distinctive for contemporary diaspora Judaism, excludes the veneration of any being apart from the one God. There is no idea of a real incarnation of God the creator or one of his agents, angels and archangels, Lady Wisdom or his logos. Even if some texts speak about enthroned patriarchs, principal angels or meditorial figures giving a clue to understanding the Jewish origins and early development of high Christology, the most widespread view about the Messiah was that he is a basically human figure. Only in a few texts do messianic or eschatological figures adopt superhuman traits. In any case, the veneration of Jesus as a God could only be rejected by the vast majority of contemporary Jews. This is confirmed by the gospel itself. John's narrative provides evidence that contemporary Jews actually consider the Johannine claims about Jesus blasphemy. Jesus is accused of making himself equal with God, and this most certainly reflects debates from the time of the evangelist. Furthermore, John repeatedly narrates that the Jews attempt to kill Jesus when he makes claims about him acting or being in unity with God. Finally, the Jewish authorities decide to kill him immediately after the greatest demonstration of his divine life-giving power, the raising of Lazarus. And their reason for demanding the death sentence from Pilate is precisely that he has made himself God's son. These claims and charges clearly come not from the time of the earthly Jesus, but mirror later debates from the time of the Johannine community and the gospel. The high Christological views of the Johannine community were rejected by the contemporary synagogue, and the gospel narrative reflects this rejection. The decisive question, however, is not whether the gospel claims divine authority and dignity for Jesus. This is clear, and all the attempts to reduce these claims for the sake of some political correctness are mistaken. The issue between the Johannine community and its contemporaries is only whether or not this claim is true. While the Jewish authorities accuse Jesus for unduly usurping divine origin and divine honors and therefore demand his death, the gospel claims that he truly is from above, that he is the son in unity with the father, and even that he is Theos. But contrary to his Jewish contemporaries, the evangelist does not consider this a denial of the monotheistic confession. Jesus' divine honors are not in competition with the uniqueness of the one God of Israel, because according to the Johannine view, the father has given the son his unique authority to give life and enact judgment. God's love for the Son is said to originate even before the creation of the world, and therefore John can write that the Father and the Son are one. Within this tight relationship between the Father and the Son, there is, of course, a slight element of subordination, as the relationship between the Father and the Son cannot be reversed. The Father is indeed greater than Jesus. But this does not mean that Jesus is only God-like. When John uses theos as a de designation for Jesus, there is no reduction in meaning. In 1 John 5.20, he even is called the true God, just as the Father is called the true God in John 
So the evangelist and his community would respond to the accusation of unduly claiming divine honors for a mere human with a simple point that he is God and that a father has bestowed divine authority on him. We can therefore imagine that for the majority of contemporary Jews, the Johannine community and its leaders had abundant true monotheism, advocated for a heresy, a teaching about, as later authors would call it, two powers in heaven. Thus, it is quite conceivable that the diaspora synagogue was no longer willing to consider such heretics as Jews, even if some of them had Jewish origins, and even if the Johannine community felt it was still based on the scriptures. There is no need to ascribe such a rejection to a decision of the rabbis in Palestine, as Martin had suggested, but it's quite plausible that diaspora synagogues were in the position to reject such a deviant groups, which could bring Jesus' followers into considerable legal troubles, especially in the time after 70 CE. Such troubles might, may be reflected in John's hints at an exclusion from the synagogue that might even cause the death of some Jesus followers, John 16. We cannot develop these aspects further here, but it is clear that while contemporary Jews could accuse Johannine Jesus followers of blasphemy, the Johannine community was conceived, convinced that the true insights into Jesus' divine dignity was not an unauthorized divinization of a human, but part of the teaching received from the Spirit in post-Easter times. The statements of high Christology are marked by the predications Theos, the Son, the Logos, and also Jesus' Ego Ami sayings. These elements provide the frame that determines the understanding of the whole and from which all the other Christological predications have to be interpreted. This is an important methodological decision. All the scholarly attempts to interpret Johannine Christology from one of the lower Christological predications, such as Messiah, the prophet, or the motive of the messenger, cannot do justice to the Johannine concept. The scholarly confidence that we might be able to historically reconstruct an early Johannine and still basically Jewish sending prophet or Messiah Christology has been decisively questioned. So there is no real possibility to get an earlier Johannine source or layer by just subtract, subtracting the traits of John's high Christology. Thus, the patterns of community development, as introduced by Lou Martin and Ray Brown, have lost their textual basis. John's Christology can no longer be explained from such an alleged development from an earlier jo Johannine lower level to the high level of the evangelist of even further on of the redaction or the epistles. Rather, it should be explained within the given context and within the framework of the Theos predication. But of course, the other Christological titles and predications are not unimportant. They show that the evangelist is aware of a wide variety of messianic traditions when he adopts in part, adopts parts of his narrative and integrates into his comprehensive high Christology. Already the opening of the narrative after the prologue provides a considerable range of Christological predications. The stronger one, the Lamb of God, the one who baptizes in the Spirit, God's chosen one, the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Son of God, the Son of Man. From the beginning of the narrative, Jesus is linked with almost all the Christological predications. There is no messianic secret in John, but Jesus' dignity is openly declared, revealed in his acts, and confessed by his followers. Moreover, the readers are already informed from the prologue that Jesus is God, making it possible for them to draw on a deeper knowledge than we can presuppose for the characters within the text. The readers know more than the characters in the text. He is the eternal Logos, who is God. He is the one in whom the divine glory is present and who makes known the invisible Father. From here, the readers can even perceive whether the characters within the text come close to their true insights, as presented in the prologue, whether they still stay behind that knowledge or even stumble about with inappropriate expectations. Before Jesus' first appearance, 
John the Baptist rejects the most common messianic categories of the Messiah, Elijah, the, and the prophet, and with his triple negation, I am not, he subtly prepares Jesus' I am, which becomes so characteristic in John's gospel. Jesus truly is what the baptizer denies himself to be, and of course, he is much more. But the baptizer's negative testimony also shows that John indeed adopts and utilizes the traditions of Jewish messianism, in particular the three forms of messianic uh, expectation, the royal Davidic Messiah, the prophetic figure of the returning Elijah, and the eschatological figure of the prophet like Moses. Herewith, John obviously wants to address the totality of contemporary Jewish expectations which Jesus is claimed to fulfill and even surpass in his divine authority. This is clear for the expectations of Elijah. In contrast with the synoptics, neither the Baptist nor Jesus is positively linked with the expectation of the coming Elijah. Instead, the Baptist openly rejects such a link, and quite appropriately, the image of the Baptist in John is not shaped according to prophetic traits but changed from that of a prophet of doom and repentance to that of a first witness of Jesus' identity and saving function. Things are more complicated with the figure of the prophet, as Jesus is actually called a prophet in several instances. The Samaritan woman calls the Judean stranger a prophet when he talks to her about her life and situation, and so she asks him for religious instruction. But in the same context, the term is later excelled by the Messiah and the Savior of the world. Similarly, after the healing of the man born blind, the initial confession, he is a prophet, is later outperformed by the title, Son of Man and the Veneration of Jesus. The predication Messiah and its translation Christos is much more crucial since Jesus Christos is the core confession of Jesus' followers from the very beginning. Interestingly, John is the only gospel author who presents the Greek transcription Messias and even translates the term for his readers first with the anointed one and then with Christos. Obviously, the evangelist wants to point to the Palestinian Jewish background of the term and to the related expectations. The predication is also clearly rejected by the baptizer in his initial questioning, but unlike the terms Elijah or the prophet, it is attributed to Jesus without any constraint. The first disciples claim to have found the Messiah, which is then explained by the phrase of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus actually is the Messiah and the expectation of the Samaritan woman, I know that the Messiah comes, is confirmed by Jesus' I am he that is speaking to you. John also adopts aspects of the inner Jewish debates about the Messiah, his provenance, his hidden, hidden origin, the signs he is expected to perform, or the idea that he should stay forever. But in those debates, the messianic knowledge of the Jews does not lead to a positive confession. Instead, Jesus' contemporaries stumble about his provenance from Nazareth, his early parent, earthly parents, or the idea of his departure. Thus, the evangelist actually casts some doubts on at least some messianic beliefs of the Jewish tradition. It is clear that John's Christological concept goes far beyond what could have been known or said about the Messiah. There is some modification in the fulfillment. In John 12, 27, Martha's confession links the terms Christos and Son of God. And the same connection is presented in the closure of the book in John 20, 31. Readers should believe that Jesus is the Christos and Son of God, and the combination might imply a, clear, a climax. The aim of the gospel is not simply to lead Jewish readers to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but rather to deepen the view of readers of the Christ, Christ Jesus in terms of a higher Christological dignity. Before turning to higher predications, we have to reflect on the sending motive. Jesus is the one sent by the Father, and he re reveals the Father who has sent him. In scholarship, the sending motive has often been explained as derived from a Gnostic redeemer myth, 
But since such an explanation is too anachronistic, and since a redeemer myth of that type cannot be found before the rise of Manichaeism, scholars have pointed to the cultural and legal phenomenon of commissioning, which can be described from the ancient Orient down to the rabbinic period. According to those cultural and legal conventions, a messenger acts in the authority of the one who has sent him, but is also totally dependent on the sender and obliged to act according to his commission. But this does not mean that the motive is to be interpreted as an element of a subordinationist lower Christology. Thus, Jesus represents God's divine authority, and as he testifies to what he has seen and heard above, he is the unique revealer of the Father. The sending motive cannot be contrasted with the higher Christological titles, but must be interpreted within the high Christology as presented in the prologue and the other predications. The sending motive is also closely connected to the use of the terms son of God and of the largely Johannine absolute term, the son. The term is introduced in 149 together with king of Israel as an interpretation and heightening to the title Messiah. In John 3, 16 and 18, it is also linked with monogenes, which emphasizes the uniqueness of Jesus' sonship. His relationship with God as his father is strictly distinguished from the relationship of the disciples as, as the children of God with God as their father. They are uh, being children of God is strictly mediated through Jesus and his unique sonship. So the predication son of God fundamentally distinguishes Jesus from all other humans and assigns him to the side of God. So the Jews interpret his claims to be God's son as a crime worthy of receiving the punishment of death. Whereas the Johannine Jesus in his bold exegesis of Psalm 82 uses the biblical address to Israel, I said, you are God's, Psalm 82, to legitimize his claim as God's son. In John, God's son is already understood as a divine being, and therefore the belief in the Christ, the son of God, is more than just a belief in Jesus as the Messiah. It is a fully valid expression of John's view of Jesus Christ as a divine being. Consist consistently, the son is determined by his relationship with the father. He is loved by the father, both work together in unity. The father is visible in the son, for the son is in the father and the father is in the son. In the farewell prayer, the father-son motive is ultimately linked with the sending motive. Here, in the concluding dialogue between the son and the father who has sent him and to, him, to whom the son will now return, the unity between the two comes to its climactic expression. Here we can see how the fourth evangelist understands the son. Although he adopts son of God as a traditional predication, which is linked with messianic traditions, the term has now become much more in his unity with the father, the son is himself God. This is also confirmed by the use of the son of man title, which is especially connected with a heavenly dimension and Jesus' heavenly origin. Whereas in the synoptics, the term is used as an enigmatic term in a variety of applications, the Johannine usage is more consistent. The term is introduced in the climax of the opening chapter in 151, where it's used in a subtle transformation of the Jacob Bethel episode. The son of man, which readers will understand as the earthly Jesus, is presented as the place of the divine presence on earth from which the angels claim up and down. In John 3.13 and 6.62, the idea of Jesus' heavenly origin and his descent and ascent is linked with the title, and in other passages it is linked in Johannine terms with the idea of his exaltation and glorification. Finally, the title is particularly linked with the motive of Jesus' authorization. In John 5.27, the view that God has given to Jesus the authority to have life in himself to give life and also to act, enact the judgment, is explained by an allusion to Daniel 7.14, for he is, without article, son of man. Here the apocalyptic background of the title and its reference to a heavenly figure is most clearly stressed. As the son of man, Jesus is a representative of the Father in whom humans not only encounter God's eschatological agent, but even God himself. Thus, in John, 
the title is an expression of high Christology linked with other titles, the Son, the Logos, and God. We can see, therefore, that the high Christological expressions that frame the Gospel, Jesus as a divine primordial Logos, the Word, and even God, is a framework within all the other predications, the higher and the lower ones have to be interpreted. It is the perspective from which the narrative episodes of Jesus' ministry are also to be read. Despite such high Christological framework, we should not forget that Jesus' true humanity is nowhere questioned in John. Jesus' divine identity and authority is not only presented in Christological titles, but also in the Johannine narratives and discourses of Jesus. Among John's narratives, the signs episodes in particular, Jesus is said to have, well, Jesus is said to have revealed his glory, and the Johannine miracle stories are so characteristically shaped with a distinctive modification of the literary genre of miracle stories towards a multi-layered form of narration enriched by interspersed references to the deeper dimension of the event or to its meaning within the whole of the gospel. This is a kind of genre, Harry's genre bending uh, in, in the miracle stories. In all the Johannine miracle narratives, we can discover a structure in which, apart from the narration of the miracle, certain textual elements refer to other passages in the gospel. These references open up symbolic aspects of meaning and direct the reader to the full significance of the Christ event and to the salvation effected by Jesus' death and resurrection. In the first Cana episode, for example, these pointers include the hint to the third day, the enigmatic mention of the hour of Jesus, the unnecessary hint to the purification practice of the Jews, and in the closer, the statement that the bridegroom or rather Jesus, has not acted like every human. In the second sign of John 4, the stress on the phrase, your son lives, and the reference to the hour, since when he got better, the hour of the healing, point the reader beyond the individual narrative and to the events of Jesus' hour in which real life originates. The typically Johannine design helps to establish the connection with what is signified and thus only makes the narrated event, or rather than the narration itself, a sign. In the reading of each individual sign narrative, readers are directed to the whole of the Christ event and to the salvation based on his cross and resurrection. Due to this characteristic literary technique, the Johanna and sign narratives can function as a means that not only causes admiration of Jesus' miraculous power, but awakens faith in Jesus' true nature as the Son of God and the divine giver of life. As the true significance and digni dignity of Jesus could only be perceived in a post-Easter time through the remembrance of the Spirit, it is clear that only from this perspective can Jesus' deeds be narrated and understood as a revelation of his true glory. Consequently, the glory revealed in Jesus' signs is not a splendor visible to physical eyes or to a perception that was already accessible to Jesus' contemporaries. It is rather the glory that was bestowed on Jesus in his hour and disclosed to the disciples only later through the remembrance of the Spirit that caused its insight into Jesus' true dignity, thus ordering a Christological development in the post-Easter period. A good example of this is the extensive dialogical narration of the healing of the man born blind in John 9. It was Martin's chief paradigm in his interpretation of John as a two-level drama and in relating the gospel narrative to the so-called parting of the ways. The extensive ep episode goes far beyond the short duration of the miracle in the first seven verses. It's a well-structured seven-scene episode wherein the themes addressed already in first verses are discussed in various groups. It would be odd to explain this well-crafted extensive text from a totally speculative reconstruction of a hypothetical science source or even an earlier and shorter essential miracle story. Not only the interpretive dialogues, but already the brief narration of the miracle itself are shaped by distinctively Johannine elements. <clears throat> 
In contrast with the synoptic healings of the blind, the blind man is blind from birth, making the miracle greater than those in all the parallels. Jesus does not answer a request from the blind man or from others, but takes the initiative when he sees the man enter. Finally, the miracle is not performed openly, but only discovered and discussed in retrospect when the blind man comes back from washing himself in the pool, testifying to various groups about his healing and the one who caused it. In the subsequent debates, the man comes to increasingly clearer confessions of faith, calling Jesus first a prophet, then saying he comes from God, and finally, after the introduction of the term son of man, even he worships him. In the course of his, this trial, he presents himself as a disciple of Jesus and is so consequently expelled from the synagogue of the disciples of Moses. In the end, Jesus pronounces his verdict about, verdict about the Pharisees who have been blinded by the light in their encounter with light, where the blind man has come to receive physical and spiritual light. So the core themes of the story are sin and belief and the works of Jesus who, as the light of the world, gives light to the blind and blinds those who claim to see or know. Thus the episode functions as an illustration to Jesus' earlier self predication as the light of the world in John 8. It is embedded in a symbolic framework in which washing oneself in the pool of the one being sent becomes an image for the purification of by Jesus or the purification from sins. Similarly, healing from blindness is a symbol for the spiritual process of coming to belief. Seeing and blindness, coming to light and staying in the darkness, even life and death are presented as the consequences of Jesus' entire sending and ministry. This episode is deliberately designed as an exemplary and paradigmatic narrative that cannot be read merely on the level of Jesus' past ministry, but serves as a paradigm of the saving works of God in general. Historically, the mention of the Pharisees and the expulsion from the synagogue refer to processes that happened to the Johannine community in later times. Likewise, the Christological insight expressed in the episode mirrors the high Christology developed in the Johannine community in post-Easter times and the climactic confession of faith and veneration of Jesus finally point to his divine authority as should be perceived from the Johannine narration. The most impressive demonstration of Jesus' divine life-giving power is the revivication of Lazarus. Here, Jesus' eschatological authority is presented in narrative mode. In John, this demonstration of divine authority causes the Jewish leaders to sentence him to death. The Johannine interpretation of the sign is not presented in a subsequent discourse, but in the ego emi saying, at the center of the pericope, even before the miracle is narrated. Jesus is the resurrection and the life, even in view of physical death. This is the densest expression of the claim that in Jesus, God in his creative, life-giving power has become present. The eschatology is implied as a consequence of the Christology. The resurrection of the dead and the last judgment, which were traditionally expected for the end time, are now present in Jesus and for the post-Easter period in his word. The whole episode shows elements of characteristically Johannine design, as does the narration of the miracle. It is Jesus who calls the dead man from the grave, as is promised in John 5.20 about the Son of Man. He acts in silent company with the Father, who answers even before a prayer is pronounced. Finally, the miracle excels any of the other biblical resurrection stories. Jesus calls back to life a corpse that stinks. It has there is one that is already in the process of decay, and so even in the view of ancient readers, there was no hope of return left. Thus, the narrative is a prominent example of John's technique of increasing the synoptic miracles and modifying the genre in accordance with his Christological intention to present Jesus as God. And it's, it is textual pragmatics it seems to push readers to a correction of their Christological presuppositions and to deepen the views of the identity and function of Jesus. <laughs>
Within the episode, there is an increasing perception of the motives of death and life. For instance, when learning about Lazarus' illness, Jesus' statement sounds almost cynical. Nevertheless, it marks the program of the whole episode. This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. While the reality of Lazarus' death is expressed with growing clarity, Jesus' power of life is also increasingly presented. During the episode, the idea is established that Jesus, on his way to raise Lazarus, also approaches his own death, which is decided upon after his mighty deed. On the other hand, he is the resurrection only as a risen one, and thus he calls out Lazarus as a consequence of his own death and resurrection. The, times, the time levels are uh, interwoven here. The eternal life he gives is ultimately rooted in laying down his own life for the sake of the people. Thus the narration of the miracle, or even the narrated miracle itself, is based on Jesus' whole salvific ministry. The resurrection of Lazarus is an illustration of the life given to those who believe in him and is, eschatologically speaking, a foreshadowing of the resurrection expected in the case of physical death. Within the Johannine Discourses, Jesus' divine authority is most distinctively expressed in the ego emi sayings. In John, the I am formula is used both absolutely and in connection with metaphorical predications such as bread, light, shepherd, and wine, as well as in related forms. These various forms are interconnected and have to be interpreted as a coherent language device that distinctively, distinctively occurs in the words of Jesus. In its linguistic form, it adopts a formula of divine revelation from the scriptures that has been rendered in the Septuagint by the expression ego eimi. The Jesus, thus Jesus speaks with the words of God's revelation at the burning bush, or of the divine self-presentations in Ezekiel and Deutero Isaiah. There is no better means to present Jesus as the incarnate word of God and having him speak out the divine self-presentation of the Revelation formula. When used absolutely, the issue is not a mere recognition, but the comforting or terrifying insight that in Jesus, God himself is encountered in his saving and judging action. This is most openly demonstrated when in the scene of Jesus' arrest, after the three times repeated ego emi, the armed band of Jewish and Roman soldiers draws back and falls to the ground before Jesus. The grotesque of this involuntary prostration most demonstrates the divine power in Jesus' words. This is also confirmed by a brief explanation following Jesus' self-presentation as the light of the world. In John 8.16, the formula is unfolded in an almost exegetical manner. I am not alone, but I and the Father who sent me. In Jesus' I am, also in its metaphorically expanded form, the unity of the Father and the Son comes to its densest expression. Jesus speaks not merely with his own authority, but with divine authority. Jesus' divinity is not only presented in his signs and discourses, but also in a paradoxical manner in his hour that is, in his trial and crucifixion. It also seems that John's ultimate intention is that the readers do not stumble on Jesus' departure and death, but rightly see him in the light of Easter as the glorified, crucified one. John's particular interest is the interpretation of the death is already evident from the sheer space he devotes to the passion narrative, including the farewell discourses. There is also a dense web of anticipatory interpretations from the very beginning of the gospel, which provides the reader with interpretive categories in advance. Thus, the evangelist conveys the categories of the theological interpretation of Jesus' death and introduces categories of exaltation and glorification that seem to be totally unfitting to the event of a crucifixion, but constitute the paradoxical interpretation of the events in Jesus' hour. The serpent episode from Numeri is taken as the visual imagination of the uplifting of the Son of Man, 
And in John 12, 23, Jesus proclaims, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. But unlike the suggestion of some scholars, this is not a euphemistic downplaying of the cruelty of Jesus' death, but an interpretation taken from the scriptures where it said that God's servant will be lifted up and greatly glorified, Isaiah 52, 13, Septuagint. For John, the deeper, true understanding of Jesus' passion and death is based on the scriptures and mediated by the teaching of the post-Easter spirit. This is also adopted in John's design of the passion story. From the very beginning, the story is designed according to the idea that Jesus consciously and willfully enters his passion. He is not the victim of vicious intrigues. Rather, in every act of his passion, he is the active part, acting in unity with the Father. Therefore, the idea of escaping the hour or not drinking the cup of death is strictly rejected. And Jesus' last word cannot be the cry of God forsakenness, but only the triumph of fulfillment is fulfilled. The paradox is obvious. Jesus was put to death because he made himself, or rather was, God's son. And in his death, he is uplifted and enthroned to reign as a true king. The narrative design of John's passion account aims at suggesting such a change of perspective to its readers so that they are able to recognize the divine glory, even and particular, in the crucified one. The gospel as a whole, in its narrative and theological design, is shaped to evoke that perspective in its readers, to deepen their views of Jesus, and to foster a true understanding of his death and departure according to the advanced spiritual insight. Where does such an insight come from? How did it evolve? Which circumstances could contribute to the unique Johannine view of Jesus' divine authority and true kingship? The groundbreaking approaches of North American scholarship wrestled with these questions and looked for explanations in relation to the parting of the ways between the Johannine community and synagogal Judaism. According to Lou Martin's groundbreaking approach, the full elaboration of John's high Christology could be imagined only as a consequence of the distancing from the synagogue and thus as a tendentially un-Jewish element. But this does not do justice to the Johannine conviction that in his high Christology, the truth of the oneness of the biblical God is not endangered. For John the Father and the Son are still one God, not two. And this monotheistic or Binitarian unity is circumscribed by the neuter, hen, not the masculine, haze. Ray Brown instead hypothetically reckoned with the influence of heterodox, temple critical Jewish and Samaritan groups that triggered the Christological development that ultimately resulted in the split from the orthodoxy of the synagogue. But if we are unable to reconstruct the earlier stages of Johannine Christology, still within a Jewish synagogal context, such a speculation is also unfounded. In my view, the Christian Christological impulse should not be underestimated here. If the Johannine view did not develop in a sectarian segregation, but in open discussion with other early Christian views, especially Mark, Johannine Christology can only be understood as phrasing the ultimate consequences of the view that as a Messiah, Jesus brings eschatological salvation and eternal life. Of course, John was not the first to voice this conviction, although it's expressed in particularly pointed form here. Already in Mark, Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. And already in Paul, Jesus could be presented as a messenger from the divine realm and mentioned on the same level with one God in 1 Corinthians 8.6. All these expressions could appear offensive or even blasphemic to some contemporary Jews. In my view, the precise development cannot be reconstructed in detail anymore, but the reason given in, for, in John's Gospel should be taken seriously. According to John, it is the Spirit who guided the disciples in the post-Easter period to deeper insights thus authoring the image of the Johannine Christology. The process described as a remembrance of, of the Jesus story in light of the scriptures. Passages such as Isaiah 53, 
with the terms hypsoo and doxatso may have been central in communicating these categories. But ultimately, the Johannine view is a result of the thorough reconsideration of the fact that eschatological salvation is based on the death and resurrection of Jesus and mediated through belief in him. If the eschatological relevance of Jesus is thought radically, it is unavoidable to focus on his authority and identity and is to describe it not only functionally but also in ontological terms, yet divine categories. From the eschatological reverence of Jesus or the reaction of humans to his appearance, it appears necessary to ask about the ultimate reason of such significance or even about the ultimate reason of salvation located in Jesus' unity with the Father and the primordial will of God, his love for his creatures. Johannine High Christology as a challenge for contemporary theology. John presents Christology as theology and theology as Christology. This is a challenge not only for ancient readers, but also for modern theological interpretation. First, the challenge is to identify an appropriate Christian concept of God. If the crucified one is ultimately God, the Father is not untouched by the death of the Son. Or phrased differently, the living God does not stay on the side of the immortals, but embraces human death and all the depth of human history. Thus, through the death of the Son of God, the image of God the Father is significantly reconstituted and structurally changed. If this is the biblical God, there is a marked contrast with all the ideas of philosophical theology. <clears throat> Furthermore, God, emphatically the biblical God, is now freshly and ultimately defined by his exclusive relationship to the Son, who makes him known in his ministry and images him so that the one who sees Jesus sees the Father. Thus, the invisible God who cannot be represented by any image has in Christ and ever since the history of Christ an image by which alone his true nature can be known. The hermeneutical challenge can also be expressed with regard to Christology. What does it mean to call Jesus God in a post-ontological era? One could say, Jesus is God, so what? How can we ensure that this does not question his true humanity? Can we just repeat, or should we rephrase, the Christology of the two natures in Christ? In my view, we cannot deny that the evangelist had a view of Jesus as ontologically different from all humans. But he was also aware that Jesus' true glory could not be perceived with the physical eyes of his contemporaries, but was only revealed to the disciples in the post-Easter period in which the understanding of the cross as glorification was developed. This implies that in his narrative depiction of the Jesus story, the evangelist was hermeneutically aware that he did not simply draw a picture of the Jesus of history, as he was, but shaped the memory of the Jesus story under the presupposition of the paschal light and the teaching of the spirit. This means that the glory which overflows the path of the earthly Jesus was perceived and also inserted in retrospect. The glory revealed in Jesus' signs is actually the glory revealed by the narrative text written in the light of the post-Easter insights. Even more so, the idea of the primordial glory of Jesus and of his incarnation are consequences of the Easter revelation rather than the presupposition of Jesus' earthly ministry. Christian dogmatics has quickly adopted the logical and temporal priority of pre-existence and incarnation. But historically, and as I assume also in the awareness of the Johannine order, the priority is in the Easter experiences and in the post-Easter spirit that inspire the remembrance of the earthly Jesus and ultimately reshaped the image in the gospel narrative. This is the only interpretation that can make sure that Jesus' humanity is not endangered by his depiction as divine. 
Therefore, an ontological understanding of the divinity of Jesus seems to be unwarranted, even though the evangelist probably shared it. This being conceded, a functional understanding of Jesus' divine authority and identity is still a valuable hermeneutical option. Jesus is God, as he is the only one in whom eschatological life is granted. He can be characterized as divine, since it is in his ministry and narrated history that the invisible God is made known in relation with us humans as everlasting love. Thank you for your patience. If Jesus can only be understood by reflecting back, how important is it that the events be historical events? That is, if there's an affirmation that there is a historical Jesus, that there is an a embodied person, he's not denying that he's a human being, but is it important that the events that are chosen by the evangelist to interpret uh, this divine being, this, this God in flesh, is it important that these be tied to a historical person or can they simply be, can he make them up? Can they be completely fictional? That's a question whether the Christ story is, could be totally a myth the Christ myth, as some interpreters, at, the, at least at the beginning of the 20th century, have tried to, to phrase it. Um, in my view, in the, in the uh, concept of the fourth gospel, there is a very strong focus on the eschatological event in the hour of Jesus, in his death, resurrection complex, which is uh, encompassed as a kind of integrated in the, in the uh, term of the hour of Jesus. So there is a strong focus that this event, and of course Jesus' death is the most certain event of his life, that's clear, that in this event um, everything is, is put together. And now we have different stories, different episodes, which are more or less, many times, less um, able to be historically uh, substantiated. So it is always difficult for the single episode to make up the historical basis of that. Even if we will uh, deal with that on Thursday, but even if we have a source, let's say Mark, it's dependent on the source, other sources are, can, can only be very brief, very uh, fragmentarily uh, reconstructed. So all those events are in some way relevant as events as if as they are uh, related to the central and to the pivotal event of Jesus' hour. His death interpreted in the light of the Easter experience. So it's clear that the Gospel of John wants to tell the history of a precise person in a certain region at a certain time. So it's an, an, an earthly story, an earthly history, and not a myth. But of course, it is our problem, our problem of the possibility of reconstructing history from our perspective, that we get some events perhaps clearer, and many others we get have to leave uh, in uh, well, disturbing unclarity. Harry. Uh, 
Thank you, Jörg, for a wonderful lecture, and uh, I agree with so much of what you said. Uh, but uh, you lead me to uh, reflect in the following way, um, and I w want to reflect a little bit and then throw a question at you. So <clears throat> uh, you are resisting the notion that Johannine theology and Christology can be explained or reduced to the social circumstances of the generation yeah. of the gospel. Amen. Um, it, you then seem to suggest that um, this, uh, at, at the heart of the Johannine theological program, um, there's a claim about a category mistake. That is, to think about the divinity of Jesus, as lots of people might have been doing, in ontological terms is inappropriate. One must think about the divinity of Jesus in, hmm, should we say, what, epistemological terms? Uh, Maybe I'm paraphrasing you incorrectly, but I think you're positing uh, an intellectual environment for the Gospel of John that's claiming something about how God language works. And uh, I'm just wondering whether there is such an environment, uh, whether you can point to people in the first century, Jews, pagan philosophers, whatever, who are analyzing theological language in that way, or is John, um, the evangelist, whoever he is, in creating this narrative, doing something radically different from anything that's in his environment? Well, if you refer to the last paragraph of my paper, um, of course, I switched from New Testament interpretation to a systematic theological question. And in the end, I didn't speak it out, but in the end, I gave some credit, horrible dictu, to Bultmann, um, because at that point, I think he has a, in his functional interpretation of Johannine Christology, there is, this is a hermeneutical option for our time when we have difficulties with ontological categories, although we cannot escape the conclusion that the author of the fourth gospel thought ontologically about Jesus being a superhuman divine being. The question is how intellectual and how uh, high uh, we can, we can uh, imagine the climate in which the Gospel of John uh, grew. And of course we are not in the Alexandria of Clement um, at the end of the second century. Of, I do think that there is a lot of theological reflection in a um, well-educated and also philosophically not uh, uneducated circle. Um, I reckon with a Ephesus and with an urban context there. And in any case, the evangelist must have been aware what he did when changing traditions and rewriting um, earlier stuff and uh, even claiming that to be the truth. So the process I, we can describe on the basis of uh, the observation of the development of uh, literary or theological processes these observations are clear. The question is, how can we imagine the awareness or the self-awareness of the circle of the evangelist? Of course, our um, possibilities are limited. We do not even know the persons behind the Jordan circle. We have claims about the ministry of the spirit and remembrance and so on and so we can we can at least and I will try to uh, substantiate this in the third lectures uh, we can at least say from some elements in the paraclete sayings that there were discussions about what are you doing with the image of Jesus does the paraclete does the spirit take things from its, his own? Does, is this uh, an unwarranted, an, an uh, unauthorized uh, interpretation of the traditional image? And then the claim is in John 6, 16, he does not take from 
his own, but from that was is related to me. And the question is, what does that mean? So it's, it, in my view, what the Johannine tradition and the Johannine school does is keeping the Jesus story just on the on a border between an interpretation that could go very far, a progressive interpretation, which is necessary for a new situation, a new generation, and on the other hand, linking it back and still keep it linked back to the story of the earthly Jesus. When we compare it with um, texts of the second century, uh, Apocalypse of James, from Nakamadi, and so on, we, we see that uh, in some texts, the reference to the earthly story of Jesus gets superfluous. And John, still, when explaining and when positing his explanation in the farewell discourse, just at the, in Jesus' hour, at the border of his death, he keeps this and he keeps, he still stays on the border between the pre-Easter and the post-Easter time. And that's, that's the, uh, the challenge and also the, I think the, the great achievement of the fourth gospel where second century authors partly uh, fall back. And on the other hand, maybe if you, if you take uh, the other extreme in, uh, one could inter interpret the, the end of Matthew, keep everything what I have told you um, as a kind of verbal representation, that is not the way John goes.